you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, the title of the message is, Blessed Art Thou Among Women. This is not a Catholic message. Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 26. It says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named, La named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, may you bless the message now. May it, uh, it speak to the moms out here, Lord, that uh, uh, what kind of uh, mother you sought for, for your son to be born. And uh, Lord, just pray that uh, uh, I believe we have those same kinds of mothers today. Uh, that raise their children in the uh, fear and nurture of the Lord. And Father, just thank you for them. Thank you, pray that you bless them today. Pray that you bless them every day. And uh, Mary's not the only one that is blessed among women. And Lord, just, uh, just pray that you bless the message now and speak to us. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. You know, Mary was a, she was a chosen vessel. You know, but if you're saved here this morning, it really doesn't matter if you're male or female, you're a chosen vessel. And uh, God can do something with you. And he, 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 looked out, he looked out for a vessel uh, for his son to be born through. And I, I take that, that you know, um, and I'll get to this in a minute, but Mary wasn't the mother of God. She was the mother of Jesus. She was to bear the body that Jesus, uh, that, that, uh, uh, Jesus would inhabit. And the Lord was looking for somebody that was going to be a good mother. And he said, he said about her, she was highly favored. God must have saw some good motherly attributes in Mary. Uh, Mary is not sinless. Uh, Mary is a sinner just like anybody else. She is uh, uh, prone to the same uh, lust and the same downfalls and pitfalls that every uh, person on this earth is subject to. Yet God saw something in her. He saw a good mother. I mean, why else would he pick her? I mean, it's, 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 she doesn't preach any messages, you know. She doesn't, um, she doesn't uh, lead millions to Christ. I mean, she's just there. Nobody, you know, makes a big to-do about her. But she raised the Son of God. And he saw something in her. And she says she was highly favored. She's a virgin. Not a loose party animal seeking pleasure. Not like in this world today where, you know, you, you got to live together for three years before you decide you're going to get married. Uh, she was a virgin. Uh, it says that uh, in 1 Timothy 5, 6, it says, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Mary wasn't like that. Mary had some virtue in herself. Uh, she is a spouse to a man, yet remains pure. She is virtuous. Uh, even after she finds out she's pregnant, and you can just imagine how that conversation went. I mean, be honest with yourself. What would you think? And she's troubled, like, you know, what, what in the world's going on here? She still remains virtuous. He said, uh, and Matthew 1.25 says, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. She remained virtuous the entire time through the pregnancy. See, she had some character. Um, it says the Lord is with her. Mary, as a young woman, is in fellowship with God. You can't ask for a better mother than that. One that's highly favored. Uh, one that is in fellowship with God. And one that's virtuous. That's what God's looking for. And not just to raise up. I realize, I realize she's especially chosen. Because what is going to uh, be born of her 
is the Son of God, uh, the Savior of the world. And definitely, as, as a chosen vessel, she probably tops the list, okay? But that doesn't mean that what's not born of you can't be great also. What's not born of you can't be used of God. What's not born of you, God can't be, uh, cannot use for his glory. I believe he, I think he just saw Mary and said, yep, she'll be a good one. She'll be a good one. He said, the Lord is with her. She's well versed in her Bible and declares to her cousin Elizabeth the prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14. She replies that all generations shall call me blessed. All generations shall call me blessed. Why? Because God chose her as a vessel. Um, Mary was a saved mother. She knew the Lord. A saved mother makes a good mother. If you, can, if you can just... A saved mother who knows the Word of God can instruct her children. The man has a part in that, but not near the part that the woman does. Uh, a man is kind of expected and should go out and go to work every day. That's the way it probably should be. I don't know about in America these days. I think everybody's staying at home getting a check now. I think that's how it's working. Um, but it's the woman that's at home. It's the woman that is uh, raising the children, sometimes educating the children, but imp imparting into them spiritual things. Uh, in, um, uh, Amelia tried to quote a verse this morning, and uh, she kind of mimics her sister, but she's getting it. And she'll learn the verses eventually. Uh, Lydia learned tons of verses. Uh, children can learn the Word of God. Now, you may not see it have any kind of effect now, but just let it work. The Word of God doesn't return void. You know, all those things that you put into them, don't you know that sometime later in life it comes back to them? Sometimes later in life, God taps him on the shoulder and says, remember that verse. And then it has an effect. That's why it's, you can't remember something you didn't ever have put in. You know that, right? Children can't bring up uh, spiritual things unless spiritual things are inputted. And if you'll put them there, God will use them. Um, but she knew the Lord. He said, Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary had a Savior. Uh, she not only had Christ in her spiritually, she had Christ in her physically. I'm probably the only one that ever could brag about that. Um, it must have been very, very strange for her. Uh, I think over the years after that, I am sure there were conflicts in her head about what all this meant. It's almost like she forgets about it or... I think there's a lot, I think there's a lot of uh, talk and gossip. And it kind of, she just kind of keeps the thing down. Um, but she was a woman of character, that's for sure. It takes, first of all, it takes character to raise children. It really does. Uh, it's probably, it's got to be one of the, the hardest things there is to do in life. Is raise children for the Lord. It is the most time-consuming, monotonous, and a lot of times you don't see, you don't see what you've produced till years later. In fact, sometimes you, you're wondering what you have produced. You know, the, the next serial killer, you know, uh, the next uh, flim-flam man, you know. Uh, I mean, you, you're afraid of what you're producing. And sometimes you'll think, man, I have, I have uh, spanked that child and I have disciplined that child, and nothing has ever come of it. It's bad as ever were, but it's not over with. It takes time. I hear music. It must be the Lord's coming back. Oh, okay. Um, it takes time for that all to kick in. And sometimes you have to wait on that thing. And that's why it's a mother's job is hard, because she doesn't always see... The fruit of that thing, right away, sometimes it'd be years. Uh, sometimes, you know, it'll take years for them to get saved, but a lot of, most of, listen, most of the time, if you'll raise your children in church, if you'll bring them to church, and you've got competent people teaching them and preaching at them, they're going to get saved. You bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the Lord's going to deal with them early. Why? He said, forbid not the little children to come unto me. 
But she had good character. It said in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. You know that Mary would be falsely accused of, well, Mary was falsely accused of adultery by the man she loved. Because he was going to put her, you know what it says, put her away? I mean, I realize they're just engaged, but engaged meant something. It meant, you know, you were just one step from marriage. And he was just going to just write it off, man. He was just going to, it was going to be like a public divorce, or a private divorce. He was going to put her away. And I, I can just imagine, she's trying, she's looking at him going, I mean, what do you say? And what are you supposed to think? What would you think? If your bride, you know, that you've never known, all of a sudden comes up pregnant, and you say, well, I don't know how that happened. It took, it took the Lord intervening in, 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 the, in, their, in the minds and dreams of both of them to convince them that this thing was of God. I mean, listen, had the Lord not intervened, He was going to divorce her and, and put her away as being unfaithful. You know, it takes character to stay in that thing and keep going. I mean, she had some character. She was condemned. You know that even after, we're talking 30, well, yeah, we're talking 30 years later, some Pharisee had the audacity to say to her son, Jesus Christ, we be not born of fornication. They still knew the story. It's still going around. She had some character. Mary was a faithful mother. In John 19, 25, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Mom's there. Something about mothers. And I realize the Bible talks about the greatest love between a, is about a father and a son. There's something about mother's love. Mother's love seems to doesn't know any bounds and it doesn't care whether it's right or wrong. You know, it's kind of like that way between us and the Lord now. You know, regardless, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Our own actions can't separate us. The world can't separate us. There's not a being powerful enough to separate us. That's kind of like mother's love, you know. Mother's love unconditionally. Uh, there, I probably, if I look back, I don't know what the statistics would be. I don't know if there, if there is any to, to be found on it. But how many mothers watched their sons being executed and dad wasn't there? Dad's a little bit harder nosed about that than, uh, than mom is. But there's been many a man executed, and rightfully so. And one executed, and it wasn't right. And she's standing right there looking up at him. That's where you'll find mom. You might not necessarily find dad there. But you'll find mom there. There's been many a curtain pulled back, stretched out on a gurney or an electric chair, or in a chamber ready to get gassed, and mom will be right there. Mary was a faithful mother. Now I want to tell you some things that Mary was not. Mary was not the mother of God. God has no mother. Just as Jesus Christ had no earthly father. Mary was a chosen vessel to birth the body God would dwell in. That's why she was chosen for that purpose. Now, the Bible says that God has no beginning. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth or ever... Uh, thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And I know we cannot, our brains can't put that together. We can't even think of eternity. We can think of, you know, two points, point, from point A to point B, and that's our idea of time. It's like a linear thing. But with God, I, I, can't, I don't even know, I, how can I explain eternity? There's no time there. 
The Bible says he inhabits eternity. And if he's from everlasting to everlasting, that means he goes eternally in that direction, that direction. That's not even correct. Who said it's got a direction? <laughs> I mean, our minds can't fathom that. One day, Lord willing, maybe we'll be able to fathom eternity. But God is from everlasting to everlasting. And uh, Jesus Christ is not a created God like the New American Standard Bible says. He's just got a body. And that's what Mary provided. Uh, Mary was not sinless. According to Luke chapter 2, she had to offer sacrifices for herself after, uh, after the baby was born. And it wasn't for the baby. In Luke chapter 2, verse 21 to 24, when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which is so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And Le Leviticus 12 says, verse 6 and 7, And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, who shall offer it uh, before the Lord and make an atonement for her. Not him. It says for her. And she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath born a male or a female. Well, if Mary was sinless like the Catholic Church says she was, then why is she making an offering for sin? Why is she obeying Leviticus? That offering's not for the baby. That offering's for her. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. I don't care what the Catholics tell you. <laughs> the Bible doesn't teach it and, and pretty clear about it. That he, was, he had some half brothers and sisters. Same mother, different father. Right? I think I got that right. Um, it said in Matthew 125, And knew her not till she brought, for, brought forth her firstborn son. I always like that because firstborn implies that there was a second born. That's their first hint. There's more in the family than just, than just him. In Psalm 69, verse 8 and 9, you have a prophecy. He says, I have become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. He said, he came from heaven. He's not of this world. He says, I am an alien. I'm just kidding. I thought that was interesting. Um, in a sense, he was. He, he, he was from another world. Uh, he said, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, the reproaches of them that approach thee are fallen upon me. In Mark 6, 3, he just comes right out and tells you and names his brothers and tells you that he's got sisters, plural. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended to him. I don't know. Catholics got reading problems, you know. But she, they, they try to say this perpetual virginity because what they're trying to do is elevate Mary to God status. Which brings up the next thing. She is not a mediatrix. She's not a mediatrix. There's one mediator, 1 Timothy 2 5, there's one, me, one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. No one in all 27 books of the New Testament ever prays to Mary, not once. Nobody asked her opinion about anything. I mean, they're glad to have her there. They understand she's blessed at a chosen vessel. Blessed art thou among women. But that's where it ended. She's not a mediatrix. <clears throat> and uh, as far as I can tell, there's a, there used to be a gospel track called uh, um, Mary's Only Command which I thought was an excellent track to give a Roman Catholic. As much as they talk about Mary, praying to Mary, and this and that, you know. And uh, it's in John chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. It says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That's great. I mean, Mary's last command. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. You know, 
You could be one of those mothers that's blessed among women. And the best thing you could ever teach your children is whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. When he says you must be born again, you get born again. When he says, hey, you need to belong, you belong in church, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, you go to church. Hey, you serve the Lord? If that's what it says, then do it. That's the greatest thing a mother can teach her children, is just to obey the Lord and do it. Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. <clears throat> Good mothers find favor with God. They do. You say, why? Because they prepare... A good mother prepares your children to be saved. That is no easy thing. First of all, you have to know... It's, you know, getting saved was pretty easy. I remember it being pretty easy. I was 16. Couldn't have had too much smarts at 16, if any. And I got it. Now, telling somebody else, or even bringing it down to a child's level, that takes a little time and a little study. But it can be done. And if you'll prepare your children, if you'll spend time with them, you can win them at an early age. Um, in 2 Timothy 1.5, it says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which, for, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Talk about Timothy. So who start? Start with grandmother. And grandmother raised Eunice, and Eunice raised Timothy. You had three generations there of saved people. Why? All because of mom. What's happened today in our country is that nobody, nobody's taking the children aside trying to win them. They, I think they think if they just drag them to church, that that's good enough. Now, maybe somebody in the Sunday school will win them. But I'll tell you what, most of that's done at home. Most of that's done because, you know, even, even children are a little bit shy about dealing with adults, but they'll deal with mom and dad. And so a good mother prepares her children to be saved. Don't ever, don't ever try to pass that on to somebody else. If somebody else wins them, that's fine. But don't ever try to pass it on to somebody else. You try to get them saved. Um, she prepares her children to be used of God. He said there in uh, 2 Timothy 1, 6, the next verse that... Follow what I just read. It says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. She prepared Timothy. I think he had a, uh, he probably had a knowledge of the book or at least a knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, Paul saying, look, you know, we just need to stir up the gift that's in you. But there's definitely some things there. He, I, Timothy becomes a pastor, a minister of God, and God uses him. And Paul uh, relies on him. And Paul speaks well of him. And that's all because it all started home with mom. You know, there's an old saying that as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. I, I, I kind of I wish I had been raised in a Christian home. I wish I had been brought to church. Now, you know, maybe, maybe nothing would have stuck. I don't know. I didn't get saved until I was 16. Maybe I would have got saved earlier. Uh, my mom and dad were not saved. At, uh, uh, neither of them were saved when I was uh, growing up. And, oh boy, I don't think I'd been to church a half a dozen times by the time I was 16 years old. And that was just friends inviting me, and I went, you know, it could have been a Catholic church, could have a couple times at a Baptist church. I absolutely hated the Baptist church. Stuck me in some little room, you know, separated from my mom, and it was all, you know, it was just kind of a weird situation. But it didn't, didn't, I didn't have a good taste in my mouth about it. And uh, so I wasn't raised in a Christian home. There's a lot of things I probably could have avoided had I been raised in a Christian home. There's a lot of things your children can avoid by you raising them right in a Christian home and raising them in church. I think about Hannah and what she did for Samuel or Elizabeth and what she did for John the Baptist. Um, 
That, that, it just did not happen without that early training. You just don't get men of that kind of character. It just doesn't happen. Uh, even Paul, I mean, he was raised, I mean, he was raised to be a Pharisee. And I'm sure he was raised in a strict home following strict uh, Jewish law. But he had that raising. It's rare, you know. We win folks all the time, and we win them from everywhere. You know, win them, win them at the rest home, win them at the jail, win them on the street, win your neighbors. There's very few people that, I mean, unless they're won early, they overcome a lot of things that are in their life. Usually what... When they get saved, what they have, what they're stuck with is what they got to live with. And usually it's the thing that they're fighting with all their lives. Now, I'm not saying you can't have victory. I'm just saying that that baggage that you brought, you're bringing it with you. And you got to deal with it every day. As far as I'm concerned, 16 is late. I got into a lot by the time I was 16. Say, so how long are you going to do it? Till the day I die. Because this thing doesn't change. Now what's inside me can. And what's inside me can grow. But this flesh is the same flesh that bowed the knee when I was 16 with the same problems. I have to deal with them the rest of my life. Whatever I sowed, I'm reaping. Whatever I allowed, I'm dealing with. And so are you. That's why sometimes you just have to say, well, Lord, this is what you got, and it ain't much. It's not much at all. Just use it. Just help me just keep the thing down. Just shut him up. Move him along. Steer him in the right direction. Dr. Rutman said there is a part of you that, do, that wants nothing to do with God. And if you've allowed that part of you to just blow up bigger than life... <laughs> I understand why you're having spiritual difficulties. I understand why some people can't get to church. I know why they don't get to church. I know why they can't get victory over sin. They have just got so much of it. They have just sowed so much to the flesh, they don't think they could ever say no to it. I've, always, I've told you before that if, there's, if you want to find out what your flesh is like, just fast for three days. Just three days. That's all, three days. Come on. What's three days? By the end of the first day, you'll be half crazy. That flesh will be crying out. And I'm not talking about your, I'm not talking about a salad fast, you know, or a bowl of jello fast, or you know, some of you. A fast is a fast. You, 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 eat, you have no food, and if you're gonna go more than a day, you just have water. Just water, not flavored water, not coffee. Water. After the first day, man. This thing's screaming. It is screaming. It's got a, you know, you're, you're cloudy, you got a headache, can't think straight. You're starting to feel pain, you know, your stomach's all messed up. You know, I ain't gonna make it. Day two comes. It's more agonizing than day one. It's not till after day three that the flesh begins to quiet down and shut down. You've gained some victory over it, but it takes three days. I always make sure I fast in the evening. If I fast in the evening, that means I, if I, I, I go to bed and wake up and hopefully that empty stomach feeling has gone away by that time. <laughs> Anything to counteract this old flesh, it's got some power, man. Bible says sin shall have no dominion over you. I think when you raise children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, you keep them out of big trouble. Not little trouble, but you keep them out of big trouble. When I see people get saved, I think to myself... I wonder how, you know, when they, get, they finally do get saved, you know, and they, they present themselves to the church, I ask myself, I wonder how bad they messed it up. I wonder, I wonder what they've laid on, the, uh, on that altar of uh, temporary sacrifices, if you will. The altar of the immediate is what I'm thinking of. I wonder what they've given up that we're never going to get back. 
Even a Christian, I tell them, I said, you know, yeah, you can't send away the day of grace, but you can absolutely destroy what God can no longer use. You can destroy it. It's obvious you can destroy it. When you raise your kids right, they usually make smaller mistakes. Oh, they, they're going to, they're going to, we're sinners. <laughs> we're going to veer off, but we don't veer over the cliff. Train up a child the way that he's going. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. He's coming back. One thing you say about that prodigal, man, he did go out there and get wild, but he did come back. But I just think when you raise your children, you keep them from making those, those kind of errors and mistakes, sins that destroy their lives. And when they do get saved, God can't even use what they've got. Or he has, you know, it's like, I always talk about plan A, plan B, plan C, you know. I'm on plan beta on a different alphabet. You know, you, you know God just jumping from plan to plan, but because you keep, you keep making a mess of it. You keep throwing something in there. Man's called to preach, but he doesn't answer the call. That was me. For a while, that was me. He said, what was that? That was plan A. I don't know what I'm on now. I think I finally got with the program, but I, I don't know what plan this is. All I know is that God will keep working with you with what you give Him. He'll work with what you give Him. Mothers, give Him something to work with. Raise them right. You're not going to regret it. You're not going to regret it. Children are a gift. And, and God blesses women with, with those children. We want to uh, give you a gift. Is my wife in here? Okay, we're going we're gonna to give you a gift, I think. Um, she's got the baby? Okay. I'm going to close in prayer, and then uh, we're going to give something to our, our mothers this morning. Just a little appreciation. And um, pray you'd have a blessed day. I should give her a little bit more warning. Usually I forget all about this part of it. I just.